Hello and welcome to the next episode of uh, Tech and Coffee's Tech News Week, episode 29. I'm your host, Joseph Youssef. I'm here with our wonderful panel. We've got lots to discuss today. Google is being all googly. The social media juggernauts are under under threat of attack. Nokia is going, I told you so. And of course, Apple's in trouble again in the media. But before we talk about our, our, uh, our issues today, let's go talk to our panel and introduce ourselves. Alex? Hi, my name is Alec Nelson. I'm a computer system security and network administration student at Dakota State University. Oh, I'm Kieran Ainsworth, and uh, I managed to get hold of technology despite being in the third world country that is Britain. Hi, I'm George Dasher. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I do IT support. And I'm Gurin, well, Heron for most people. I work in physical security, and I'm an IT nut job and a photographer. And I love beer. I'm Jeff Zayas. I'm a semi geek from uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Matt Janey in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm just a part time geek. I'm Richard Cleveland from Naked Ape Productions, a grassroots internet broadcasting company from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Hi, I'm Robert Taylor. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm a full-time geek. I'm Bill Bachman. I'm an electrical consultant from Anaheim, California, and I have a high interest in tech. Wow, thanks, guys. Clearly, we have a pretty diverse population today from the U.S. to Canada to I don't even know where Gerwin's from. I always forget. Forgive me. And uh, we're all over the place today. Um, but we've got lots of discussions. So what's your take about being green from Google? Google is investing $200 million on a new wind farm. Is this eco-friendly or is this just smart business? What do you guys think? I think they want to kill birds. <laughs> probably true. Um, I think it's actually a good business practice, but as well as eco, you know, it, it has a, pop, a probability of helping the environment, but at the same time, it could alter some, some things with the uh, atmosphere. I don't, think, I don't think Google are doing it just out of the goodness of their hearts. I mean, yeah, there's going to be goodness behind it. But think about the publicity when you say, you know, a company has invested $200 million into green energy. That's some pretty positive publicity, unless you're a bird, in which case you hate that news. That's bad news, very bad. Well, I got to say, these wind farms, we've got one just south of Calgary here, and unfortunately, they are A, an eyesore on the landscape, B, they're not as energy efficient as, you know, the, the green hogs would like us to think. So, as far as I'm concerned, I think this could be a big publicity ploy for them. You have oh, absolutely. to remember that a lot of what Google does is all about the publicity. I don't think Google is very above board with everything that they do, but you can bet they calculate everything that they do. And, you know, $200 million to Google is a drop in the bucket. Um, it may sound like a lot of money to most folks, but to the likes of Google, it means nothing. But that $200 million worth of advertising is definitely a good thing. Absolutely. You add up what the advertising value is and the fact that Google's such a huge power consumer, so they have a huge advantage of the economy of scale and in investing in major equipment like that. More than 90% of Google's revenue comes from search, but some of its biggest yeah. bets are, are just being made in seemingly unrelated fields. Yeah. It's um, a, just to correct you, it comes from advertising, not search. 
Oh, that's a good point. Well, go. this thing is called the Spinning Spur Wind Project. It's supposedly set to produce 161 megawatts of energy. That's enough to produce 60 homes, and uh, and it supposedly is going to have 70 turbines produced in Texas. Texas has always been the energy guys. Do you think this is a good thing in terms of jobs, or do you think this is a way for them to actually cut costs in terms of energy consumption uh, with uh, all of these data centers uh, that these guys are buying? Um, I do not believe it's going to help them cut costs purely because of the fact that they don't have any of these wind farms near any of their data centers. Yeah. Remember that one data center is in uh, Georgia, one data center is in Iowa, and yes, they are, they are planning on doing a wind farm in Iowa. It's still about 100 miles away. So they have a couple others, but their, their planned projects are not anywhere near any other data centers. And I think that's part of their publicity, publicity on it is the fact that they want to say, this is not for us, this is for you. It's the same. It's Kansas City, similar. You know, it, it's not so much that they're starving to get customers to sign up for an internet service. It's simply the fact that, hey, look, we've done it, and they're getting the, the positive you know, feedback and the positive flow that makes them look good. You know, a, a, an energy farm that's 100 miles away from the, the consumption of it is pointless. That, that, that has nothing to do. It, it was simply a, a publicity uh, stunt to, to actually give them some credibility and free publicity that just makes them look better. That's all it's about. And that's what it that's what I was saying, Robert. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing. Now. That's what I. But I'm do you agree. think, honestly, do you guys think that this is just falling in line with what other companies have done? Like I mean, Apple, they decided they wanted to do their green thing. Now Google, being that they are such a juggernaut in the internet web space, that they've decided that they want to kind of make their little mark in the green uh, field as well. No, yeah, Google's been out there from the start. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have to appreciate the fact that Google is literally just a business and they're going to do everything they do is going to be for the so you know the, the core you know the root cause is i want to make money so yeah. you know they want this good publicity and all that and it's and it's different from like other companies like you know say apple they don't need to do that anymore they sell these free devices google makes their money by appearing to be the good guy uh and they are they're, they're good guys i like google I, I i just want to say that uh you know i'm I, i'm kind of close to their offices and all their offices in, in fact the youtube office is the Green, one of the greenest buildings in, on the planet. So um, it's not just the uh, you know the wind farm. Their offices are are green as well. In fact, the um, the roof on the YouTube office is a living you know has grass on it. So it's kind of like well, a, a, are there tax cuts involved with that? Because a lot of companies get tax cuts if they get a lot of their energy from green but sources. I'm just saying it's it's something that they're it's per pervasive through their organization. It's not just one thing, you know. It's they're not yeah. just doing the wind farm. They do other things as well. well so it's, I think it's people is their mantra, the and they have to live up to that. And they well they take do. it take. Here's two things. They don't. They about. don't. They don't have to live up to anything. They 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 make a ton of money. They're mm -hmm. the biggest boy on the block. They can live up anywhere they want. But I, I just say I just think they're they're trying to do the right thing at on certain levels. Is it going to make a big dent? No. But at least it's a, it's a it's something that they prefer to do instead of not doing. Just Remember, FYI, here's... Google's actually has eight uh, current and planned server farms that. Could consume up to 476 megawatts of electricity. That's enough remember, power to power all the homes in San Diego. And guys, yeah. keep in mind that in Council Bluffs, for example, they still own two more properties that they they're planning on. They're building one more right now in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and they're planning on building another. But here's the other thing to think about: is the fact that remember the government is uh, the government in the U.S. is you know, very big on trying to do this whole green initiative, right? So what kind what does that do for Google to make themselves look green with the government? So yeah, there, there's obviously it's a little presumptuous until the policy's out there to actually incentivize it. But uh, it could be that they uh, are talking to folks and maybe looking ahead at what policy might be coming in this administration. That's a very nice. good point, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Let's move on to our next topic. Um, changes in social media juggernauts. While uh, 
Facebook is trying to figure out ways to monetize. Google is trying to figure out how to socialize. And uh, and Instagram, the once big picture guy, is now in a lot of trouble, especially after its uh, 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 terms of service change. Many people disconnected and just didn't want to come back. There's some new players in the field. It's uh, One such thing is called Snapchat. You've heard of your kids, your younger generation. They don't want to use Facebook anymore. Why? Because their parents are using it. So why is so cool? What is so cool about Snapchat? Is it a sexting tool, or is it just the next Instagram? It's all about the impermanence of it all. What do you mean, Matt? I, I mean it's it's something that that's floating as it is now. I think people are starting to realize that that uh, their imprint on on the web is going to last, and there is no true anonymity. There's no true privacy, and so some of these services that offer. Uh, the perception of having uh, privacy, having impermanence about your communications, they have an appeal. I, I think that they have a limited space, but obviously, you know, things like sexting and looking at, at some of the scandals we've had with politicians and athletes, uh, you know, folks are looking for, for something to, uh, you know, do what they might do but have repercussions in, in the past. But in, but in another sense, I think a lot of people are valuing uh, having some impermanence somewhere on the internet and some true sense of privacy. Now, can we really trust that? I don't know. Uh, I think with Snapchat, don't they have kind of a system where their uh, where their servers purge everything over a short amount of time? I think so. They promise some sort of uh, some some privacy, and that that stuff's going to be uh, uh, cleared from their servers. But I think there's an attraction to that because so many folks have been uh, stuck with the reputations that they've built on the web, accidentally or incidentally. Uh, you know, I kind of think you might be right about that because when you, you kind of look at uh, the way social media has changed over the last five years, for instance, I mean, we had Facebook to start off with. We had some of the other uh, MySpaces and that kind of thing, which are, have kind of gone by the wayside in North America but are very popular elsewhere in the world. Now we see this insurgence. We've got the Twitters. We've got the Instagram. We've got the Pinterest. This is just another tool in that box, I think, for people to jump on board and say, oh, well, maybe this might be the way I can get my sort of 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, and the problem comes in the fact that uh, it's all fine and dandy now, but what about when a company like Facebook uh, buys them and ruins them like they did with Instagram? Because Instagram was quite a cool tool when it came out. Like, oh, filters, instant, you know, instant pictures and stuff. And then Facebook bought them, and you see now that everyone's leaving them because, you know, it's no longer cool because they've been messing around with it too much. The so Snapchat is a, is a nice idea. If it remains simply executed, that'd be great, but it won't. Well, just as an FYI to all of you guys and the viewers out there, Snapchat is just a mobile app which lets users or senders share images and videos that will disappear after a few seconds or however long the sender chooses to send them. That's right, I said that. They actually vanish forever in the time that it takes for you to read a tweet. So for those people who say... Everything's out there nowadays. We just have to give it up. Well, here's a great app of why people say they're still fighting. So do you think this whole idea of privacy is still dead? Absolutely, yes. I do. Yeah. Like I said, at the moment, it gets taken over by a larger company, such as Facebook. Uh, they could potentially claim uh, the right to store all of these images even after they've been deleted. Because you get them to, deleting them out of a stream and deleting them off the server is a very different thing. So they remain there. I don't know what what the thing with Snapchat is. I don't know if they actually get deleted off the central server. Um, I believe the promise is that they are deleted off of the server. Uh, but I would find that hard. I would find that very hard to believe. I would think there's some legal ramifications if someone is pointing as um, has something out there that's uh, you know pornographic or whatever that's incriminating and, and they wanted to get a court order to get it I yeah. bet you they would but even have if they, problem. they'd get it if it's available but I think that that's part of their that's part of their uh, way of avoiding that I think is to build in that they that they have a system where they're not going to take responsibility for it because it is uh, something that has an air of impermanence about it and they're guaranteeing that as the entire model of it well it comes it really comes down to their EU, EULA I mean, what is their what is the rights given to the user? When it, when it does come down to it, 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 it you're right, Darren or uh, Alec. It, it is about the rights given to the user, but they're pretty clear in their statement that it's there for a specified period of time that you indicate. 
So if I put uh, something up, a, a post or whatever, and I only want it there for 10 minutes, they've in, in essence guaranteed me at that point that they're going to remove it. And as far as, you know, posts where they might get a court order, I'm sorry, Your Honor, our terms of service is that we delete the, the, the post at a specific period of time. No court is going to hold them accountable and say, you must maintain it. That's not yeah. going to happen. You don't know. You don't know. I'm not a legal guru, but just because I put up a sign saying I'm not responsible for any damages, that's not the case. I might be responsible for damages. That's so, if someone, so if someone, 99% of the time, that's going to let you out out of any damage. If it were possible to retrieve them, they could be forced to uh, to try to retrieve that through forensic, uh, you know, review, but. I think yeah. the whole idea is that they have this scrubbed in in a way that it's gonna that's gonna be gone, and but, if, if that's but, the but policy, anyone, there's nothing you can do. If it's gone, it's gone. If it's you know truly. But anyone who believes that they post something on a service and it's gone off the face of the earth is, is gonna be is in for a well, rude awakening because well, someone could screen scrape that and, and post it, yeah, and it just well else. that's that's the other thing. It does it does uh, is supposed to notify you if you do take a screenshot, but just as quickly someone will write uh, an app that will automatically capture everything that comes in. Uh, so you can't ever like assume true privacy, but the fact is that someone has to be intentionally at that point looking to grab the content that you put there, and that's what still gives some people some semblance of security and privacy is that you're not creating a, a record like you are in Facebook and your blog and your Twitter that somebody can review later on when they want to look back at your past or review you for a job or uh, you know. And investigate you at, later on for whatever purposes. We saw this with, we saw this with Instagram, uh, where everything is based on the wording of the user agreement. They have to word it right if they're going to keep their users. Because Instagram, they weren't saying, you know, what everyone thought they were saying. It wasn't as bad as they made it, you know, as, as people made it out to be. Because I, you know, I read it and I thought that's, you know, horrifying. I completely misread it apparently. Um, but the problem was, if it's not clearly worded. In a way that the lame and the layman can understand, you're going to lose users. If users look at it and are worried by it, they're going to leave. And that's the risk here: is if you make it too precise, then it's difficult to work around. And if you make it too vague, then users get scared. Well, then you know I've got to ask this question. Let's assume for a minute that they're going to scrub it. You know, it's going to go away. Where what is the value of the company's model at that point? Because there's no his, you know, the whole thing about keeping the data is its historical value. If the data only has a lifespan of 15 minutes because they said they scrubbed it, what sense does that make for the business model itself? You know, they have no his, history to go back from. Is is what I'm asking. You're actually bringing up a good point, Robert with that being with that happening the way it is the way you're saying but everyone's moving to snapchat well what model does that make facebook then if they're trying to do all this monetizing and no one wants to look at it exactly. yeah but you yeah. know you i hate to hate to break it to everybody but uh you know their stock is at 3130 today so it's up was up 20 percent over last week so it's what it has weathered the storm it's coming back so you its value is not at what it opened at forty, but it's at thirty-one. So they are making money somewhere, right? Well, and that's exactly the point. I mean, we've got other companies out there, and we've been talking about Facebook for as an example with the Instagram model. Yesterday on Facebook, there were pictures posted of um, what is her name, Linda Blair, from a Playboy spread that she did, where she was wearing lingerie and she was topless. Now, I believe that those images have been pulled down, but that being said, how many of those images went out worldwide? And in a 15-minute span, that one image that you have can be sent to a million, a hundred million people at one time and go out over the Internet and be show up on a million different websites, especially if you don't want it to. This is so the there thing goes I always... that, that image of privacy. This is the thing I always say is is the moment you log on to the internet, you have sacrificed your right to privacy. Okay? We shouldn't have to, but that's the way it works at the moment. There's no way of being so secure or so, you know, uh, you know, assured of your of your right to privacy. The moment you've logged on, you are vulnerable, you are open. And so don't be posting stuff you don't want people to see. That's the simplest solution I can come up with. 
and and that's the most common sense solution either as well. I mean, why why would I as a person want to go out and you know hurt myself by posting pictures of me uh, beating up someone's car or something like that? Why would you put that out there? What common sense is that? And then at that that actually really describes on who you are. Hey, Alec, yeah. I've got like a 20-minute video of you dancing over and over again. Mm, that you know is what? a good oh, point. Yeah. It's, it's really I'm, pretty sure we've got some, I'm pretty sure we've got some pretty incriminating photos of you at a certain convention, George. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Man, am I glad I'm the new guy. <laughs> that involved a lot of latex, George, a lot of rubber. I'm not sure what to make about it. I was, um, I was offended. I was yeah. offended. We were all offended. <laughs> Yeah. But speaking of common sense, guys, see, we find that to be common sense now, and sounds up makes sense. Sounds like that makes a lot of sense. But Nokia right now is coming back and says, saying a big fat, I told you so." They opened up a big fat of, you know what? I knew what I was doing. Everyone else is wrong, and they just had a seventeen percent stock jump. Why? I don't know. Something to do with the Lumia, and maybe people are starting to look at the Windows Seven phone. Do you guys think it's because of Windows Eight showing a lot of? Uh, Fair play, people are really liking Windows 8. Do you, do you know what it is? Yeah. And the reason I actually bought a Windows Phone 8 device? Uh, they were clever with their marketing. Like, I, I can't use the Windows Phone 8 device now because I, I, the guy I bought it from reported it stolen. He scammed me, and I can no longer use it as a phone. It's now just a little mini tablet. Um, uh, I've given it to my dad. But the thing is, it has some really interesting features. It is visibly different to pretty much any other mobile operating system on the planet. Visibly different. I mean, when you get right down to the nitty-gritty, it works pretty much like all the others, but its aesthetics are entirely, you know, entirely different. It, it, it focuses on a different way of doing things. Uh, the Lumia boasted some very interesting specifications. It looked nice. It it, it felt okay. I, I, you know, I used it a few times. The camera was a really big uh, thing. Everyone wanted to look at the camera. Uh, and just interesting things. They were bringing something new to the table. Things that had, you know, some of the things had been in Android for a while, but people are inherently, I think, scared of Android. Uh, the name Android, because they use Android phones, but you say the word Android, and people are like, oh, oh you got to be like a computer expert, you use one of those. Yeah. This was the thing. It looked friendly, and it looked like it had a lot of features going for it. Here's a quick comment from uh, Dan Nichols. Uh, don't post anything you wouldn't want your mother or the police to see. So that kind of sums it up, you know. Oh, uh, you know. What if your mother's a policeman? A policeman. <laughs> oh, I'm a college professor <laughs> once. That's terrifying. This is a couple years ago. It's probably going back to 2001, 2002. But a college professor once said um, to me, and it makes sense, or to the class actually, um, do not anything you post online is always going to be there, and you could take it down. But that means somebody else has probably already copied it and posted it somewhere else. So you can't yeah. take that down. So, I mean, you could take down the what you put up there, but if somebody else has taken it, it's always up there. You, and, and it could be duplicated thousands of times. That 15 minutes, like I said earlier, is like an eternity on the Internet. Because yeah. at some point in time in that 15-minute span, you're going to have a, a million people repost that image. Oh, 4chan so is out there, baby. 4chan. <laughs> why, why do you think I never I'm, wear a hoodie? I'm pretty, no, sure, actually, I'm pretty sure that there are some uh, some boards on 4chan that would quite like your convention pictures, George. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure I'm up on 4chan now. So. Yeah. <laughs> there is a rule on 4chan. Chain. What What is on the internet stays on the internet. Yeah, it's, it's Fight Club. Forever. Um, 4chan is Fight Club. Yeah. But, um, 4chan, you don't talk about 4chan. Yeah. But about Nokia, uh, you guys talk about Nokia being, I don't know, what the stock went up or down? It went up. It went up. Okay, then then let me show you a picture that makes me wonder why the hell it goes up, because I don't know, I don't understand why. I uh, want somebody these, to tell me too, because I heard about it, yeah. but I can't imagine what Nokia did to actually Look, look at these figures. I, yeah, these are the current say. sales of Nokia phones, and the Symbian and the Lumina together. That's the Windows I was gonna 8, say. 7 phones. It's going like, it's almost hitting... Rock bottom. Nokia is history. Yeah, this is the thing. It, it's a lovely. It is a lovely phone. I, I do enjoy using it. But the thing is, yes, it's gone up seventeen percent. But like you've seen from that chart, they're going up. You know, is you can't go down from the bottom of the hill. The only way to go is up. Uh, this right. phone has, you know, it has an interest. It sparked an interest in people. But how many people? 
how how many people are going to move. I mean, I, I found it quite difficult, the lack of, of uh, Google apps over on Windows Phone. Google is, is so large now, people aren't just going to drop their Google services and go to Microsoft's equivalents. So unless Microsoft can, you know, get together with Google, sort something out, get them making their apps for their platform, get everyone working with them and become a properly, fully-fledged platform within the next couple of years, I don't see Nokia making any form of, of big comeback. Yeah, and, and the point that it's... In about years. So they're not going to... It's not going to be a couple of years. It's going to be a lot shorter than that. And that's not just a, a slight against Nokia. It's an actual statement of fact, um, I should say a statement of opinion about Windows 8 on the whole. I don't think there's been that much interest in Windows 8. I don't think it was the blockbuster, do all, change all, wow everybody's, you know, socks off that Microsoft hoped it was going to be. I think a lot of people do want to see another phone uh, system available other than Android or iOS. But the bottom line, I'm not sure that people are convinced that Windows 8 phones are it. There's only two other manufacturers that I know of that are planning to come out with Windows 8 phones. And oddly enough, both of those guys aren't even coming to the U.S. We'll find out at Mobile World Congress next month. But the bottom line is, I don't think the interest is really there for Windows well, 8 phone. I think like Microsoft I say, has stepped on both the phone and on the desktop. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take... It, the, the only way you're going to get mobile, you're going to get these mobiles into people's hands, is if, you, if if Microsoft strikes up a deal with all of the companies whose apps are absolutely essential in the mobile world today. You know, mm -hmm. I, iOS and Android both have the Google uh, Google services. Why doesn't Microsoft have it? That's a massive flaw in their marketing scheme. Uh, well, it's the same problem, deal. Yeah. There's yeah, not it's... much space at this point. I know people are craving other things, but there's only so much you can get your head around. And kind of the de facto is still people who've gone with the generations from the early iPhones all the way through and stayed in the Mac world when it comes to mobile. And then there's kind of the resistance of folks that have driven the Android platform forward and all the new handsets and hardware that are that are running Android now is, uh, you know, bringing up a huge populace. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the Windows 8 as a, as a branding, even when you're trying to transfer it over to the mobile space, all of us have, have been conditioned to skip every other issue of Windows. You know, I mean, from the very beginning, yeah. it's always been a success and a fail, success and a fail, and you yeah. always want to be slow, slow enough to ad adapting that you realize th that this is, in fact, the failure you expected in between. You know, yeah. and the problem is right now they keep on failing because, uh, like last time, there was a information that Google is going to drop support for Windows phones on transferring accounts and telephone numbers. That so, the and there was something else that they're dropping. Uh, it's like Windows is keep like falling down all the time and Google is going like ha, 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 we just stopped the service click off yeah. and there goes Windows phone down again but I think what we're forgetting gentlemen is that Windows 7 had a phone there was a Windows 7 phone available now that didn't do so well so now they're trying to rebrand that under the Windows 8 moniker and with a new operating system on these on these new devices and I think what's going to happen is we are going to see a little insurgence in what happens in in the marketplace as far as Windows 8 phones goes but I think there's still a lot of trepidation in the marketplace and with consumers that are saying well you know Apple's been around for a long time and Android's really starting to prove themselves so what can Microsoft bring to the table other than this phone that maybe works with everything that I already own they so can, they've never they been can, successful. They, can partner, they yeah. can partner with somebody to reduce the cost of, of the phone service, right? They could subsidize it a little bit, make it the Absolutely. cheapest carrier phone out there, and then people might start using it more. So, you, you, they're, you know, they have a lot of money. There's a lot of things they can do. They just started out with Google, I mean, with Windows 8. I mean, it's not, uh, time is still on their side. So, uh, are they going to die? I don't think so. I think they're really? totally on to something by bridging the mobile space and the desktop operating space. That's huge. But, but Windows is, history is a failure in the mobile space. I mean, the from the beginning, is, my first, my first uh, mobile device, the operating system was Windows, you know, the old HTC devices. It was really a terrible failure as much as it was interesting what was happening at the time. Well, wait, even take it farther back than that. You have the, the remember the PDAs that Windows had? 
Windows CE. I love those phones. Those Palm Trios, those are great phones. But that's the Trio was the made different. By Palm. It wasn't made by Microsoft. Yeah. You have the HPs that had Microsoft on them. And those yeah. did not do as well as the Trios. The Palm Trios had Windows operating system. They were I, I think HP bought Trio and then they killed it. Right? <laughs> Sounds about right. That's what HP does. But I think when it comes to the desktop uh, Windows, their problem mainly came in the fact that from the op, their marketing scheme alienated users. Because what they actually needed to do, and I think I've said this already, they needed to show users the desktop first and say, you know, it is like Windows 7. It's just, you know, it's a more powerful, it's a faster version of Windows 7. And then you move on to the start screen, and that's where you start to show people we're tying everything together. Because that way, you make you ensure that you tell people that it is still Windows, and then you show them the new feature. If you show them the start screen first, they be, they begin to sort of just go, oh no, I'm not gonna, not gonna, gonna bother looking at the desktop. You're probably right, Kieran. But tell you what, let's talk about another big uh, uh, tech juggernaut for us just a second. Apple. Apple is in trouble again. While Google has been all pretty and googly and all fun and dandy about, you know, let's make things going eco, Apple's third-party manufacturer, Foxconn, is in trouble again, this time for uh, bribery. What do you guys think of this? What's going on? I mean, why, why is it that Apple is still dealing with Foxconn after all of its issues? Why does any company deal with Foxconn? I mean, there's there's a handful of companies out there that still deal with Foxconn, and they make these products. Foxconn is going to grease whatever wheels they have to to get the product in the marketplace. That's as simple as it is. That's I, it. I, I think that's how it works. You know, that's just exactly how it works. It, you know, and especially over there. You know, that's it's it, it's and you know why not? That's how business works. That's how. That's how things get done. There's backroom deals everywhere. Governments do it. Your local governments do it. So guess what? It's part of business. Anybody yeah, heard of the say, Teamsters? Foxconn is known primarily as the contracting manufacturer for an estimated 40% of the world's consumer electronics. So it's not just Apple. That's a whole lot of people, including Intel, Microsoft, and Cisco. So why is it when we hear Foxconn, we always talk about Apple? And Apple says they're, they're talking about coming to the U.S., but you think they are the US? single largest company in the world, and they have the single largest share in what Foxconn does right now. You know, it, they are the ones driving. Think about, you know, you say they they do a forty percent of the world's electronics. Okay, now consider just how many of those are the iPhone alone. You know, it's going to be a, a a goodly portion of that. Um, so we hear about them all the time because they they this enormous company. They have the resources and the ability to produce things elsewhere, uh, but of course they don't because that way they would have to decrease their profit margin or increase their prices, and they can't do that. But you know, we we have this thing of uh, we need to um, they need to produce them somewhere. And well, but but Foxconn already stated that they're going to open a factory in the United States, right? So they're they're moving their operations here because they're afraid that people. Are going to start saying, you know, let's move, we're made in the United States, so they're they're going to move their stuff over here because the writing's on the wall. They they, they need to do that. But you know, everyone's you know, you know, look at Apple. I, I I'm the I, I kind of like going back to the stock, you know, and Apple's stock right now is five twenty three. It's up six percent. So you know, where is the damage to Apple? Nothing. It's going back up. You know, this this is an underdog story because. Apple has always been considered the underdog in the marketplace. Microsoft PCs in general have always dominated the marketplace in terms of sales. Now they want to pin something else on the underdog just to bring them into the news. And this is exactly what the news does all the time. They want to bring that name forward so it's in our head. And I think that this is just another way of doing that. Apple, okay, Apple did bribery with Foxconn. Ooh, big deal. Well. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about Apple. Okay. Well, there's been a lot of changes out there. We've actually touched on two of our predictions from our predictions episode of what was going to happen in the uh, in this next year. One was talking about a change in, in our social media and a much bigger influence in how Microsoft was working. Sounds like it's working for its phone division. Look at Nokia. Social, you know, you've got Snapchat kicking into that. Now we have something that, 
we kind of figured we should have talked about, but somehow it never even occurred to us. It, maybe you can in part, maybe you can kind of count it in as part of our integration of the household. But streaming media is now coming into play, at least in the United States. Apparently, it's been around for a while, but really, maybe it's part of our laws that we have, our stringent policies that's been more business friendly than it was consumer friendly. Don't know. Um, there's a company called Aereo. It's bringing. It's bringing streaming TV to 22 cities in the country. Why is it we're just now really talking about uh, IPTV? Well, it's not. And, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart as a cord cutter. So basically right now, they're in New York. They're, they are actually delivering content of over-the-air television to people in New York. They are talking about expanding but they have big time lawsuits all over the place. They did just bring, I believe Bloomberg was their first cable television network that they're gonna actually bring. But, you know, I, I really, I, I have trouble with this because, you know, we've been able to stream media a hundred different ways for quite a while now. And it just hasn't really caught on in, in the US, like you say, Joe. But the real question here is that if you can get some, something over the air for free, okay, and you have, there's no restriction on it, if you've got a television, you can get it for free. This service comes up and says, you know what, you can get that same service, we'll record it for you, and you can come back and get it. Why is the media companies going after them? Why are they trying to sue them now? You give it away for free over the air, but yet now you're going to sue somebody for allowing their subscribers to record and view later. That is why it hasn't caught on in the U.S. Well, here's that the other thing. Nonsense. Well, here's the other thing that's coming into mind. They're doing it in cities, but it's internet-based TV. Shouldn't you be able to watch it from anywhere? What kind of legal issues are occurring from these different service providers that they're actually being blocked by? Time Warner Cable, you're not allowed to play in my area, or things along that nature. What exactly is going on? Again, that's the thought. question. That's the double speak of the media companies. That's I would have thought the, the, it was the case that, uh, you know, they, they these companies simply don't want another company profiting off of something they give away for free. You say they give away this this content streaming uh, free online. No, 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 I didn't say that. You do have no, no, internet based. Uh, you do have IPTV is just an internet-based TV service, so you do yeah, have yeah. companies that charge, but then you do have some that are online for free. So I'm not saying specifically the ones that are free. Aereo is one example of it's not free; it's paid. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's, the content they offer is free. It's over-the-air television. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that that's the thing. It's not like you can get cable only or HBO or Stars or any of that. It's over the air standard. Air but is it television. is it like is it like rebroadcasted without the consent of the original broadcaster? Is is that's what's going on? Well, is it? Well, broadcasting is a pretty. You got to define broadcasting. You know, what I'm saying over, we're saying OTA, right? OTA versus cable, right? That's Am I broadcasting doing. it when I when I save it and stream it? You know, uh, in my media center at home. Exactly. So if 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 Matt decided to pay me. $10 a month, and he said, hey, Robert, I want you to record these five shows, and he paid me $10 a month so that he could have those five shows recorded for him, and they're over the air. Do we now say that I'm violating copyright because I provided him that service? Actually, you are. How? How? Because how? You're, you're charging for a service that you're not legally entitled to. Yeah, that exactly. You didn't get say. you didn't get authorized consent from the publisher yeah. to record that and but, then okay. sell those programs. Whoa, 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 whoa! You broadcasted it over the air. Both Matt and I am entitled to receive it over the air for free. The only thing that Matt has paid me for is for the hard drive space that his program that he chose to record got recorded on. Uh, there's the yeah. scenario I, right there. Is that I, I would be in control. Of recording it no different all this happened back when when VHS recorders got in everybody's house too you know the same kind of battles happen uh, how is it any different if say uh, you know Robert's running a server for me and I'm just controlling it from my computer 
to save on that server and stream back to myself the same way I would in my own private network okay. in my home. Okay, well, this is a mistake you're making. You're trying to bring logic into business. There is none. You can see that there is a logical solution to this, and, and that this should not be a problem at all. But the businesses are going, mm, well, I can see our, ourselves not making as much money if these guys do something. And it's like, uh, no, you We all realize that, that all the interests so are working against worried. it, you know. You are uh, you've so got worried about the networks and content providers are threatened. The uh, the uh, cable and internet providers are threatened. Those these cable and internet providers, Time Warner, Cox, the ones that we're talking about here, those are the cable gateways that are making the deals with these content providers. And you know they're doing. Uh, those folks are trying to bend each other over every direction every day. You know, I mean, we've heard about those battles playing out in the media. Uh, I mean, you could just imagine, you know, how ruffled they're getting. Uh, when people are truly threatening a dumb pipe, using them as a dumb pipe as just a, you know an internet service, and taking all that content power away from them and bringing it back to the actual providers or the uh, original content uh, producers. Well, let me tell you about what's going on. I was actually thinking about this. This is me going into more of that uh, cord cutting uh, uh, arena. Because um, I, I have cable, just like many people, or satellite dish, you know, some people have that. But this would be an avenue that may, some people may be wanting to take. Um, I found an IPTV service in China, uh, and, and it's not a Chinese service. It's actually a service that provided for expats, foreigners who live uh, in, in other countries. And so they don't want to deal with, with China's uh, uh, censoring and stuff like that. So there's a company in China that does IPTV. Now, I've, like I said, I know other people who have it in India and in Singapore and, and even in Hong Kong, but it's IPTV. It's a paid service, and for uh, $50 a month, you get all your HBOs, all your Cinemax, all your stars. You get four SPNs, and you takes out all the, the a la carte stuff that no one actually watches. So why don't I pay for that, for internet streaming, because I'm paying for it. It's yeah. legal. Yeah. 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 Why well, don't you? Licensing. I'll take the link. And just like uh, in yeah. Sweden, just like in Sweden, that H you don't have to. You can um, purchase HBO a la carte, right? You get it over uh, streamed automatically. IP. So wait till you know content providers start doing it themselves. That's when. That's what every. That's what they're afraid of, and then it becomes well, an a la carte service. And they are riding the line and pushing into the a la carte space. The, the other thing to think about is, remember the product uh, Slingbox? Slingbox has been in the market for, what, five, six years now? And right. yet they, they do the same exact thing as what we're talking. Sure they do, but the difference is, is that it's done. That is Matt doing it in his home, home rather than him hiring me and my server space to store his recorded television. That, that's what the slight difference is. And, and the argument is, is that... We're not going to get a la carte as long as Time Warner, Cox, and those folks are allowed to run, you know, rampant over us. And, and, and the government has to step in and say, wait, no. Because we don't need, the reason we don't have a la carte is because they want us to subsidize all of the lesser known channels. We all know that. The bottom line is, is how many of you guys watch golf TV? It, I'll oh, hold my hand up. Your, your they have golf TV? But, yes, I love golf TV. But but the truth of the matter is is that that's far less than ESPN. Right. So if you want ESPN, you're also going to pay something so that the other guy can get golf. Well, no. Let the guys who want golf pay for golf. I'll pay for ESPN, and Jeff will pay for HBO. But that's going to be a long time coming because Cox and Time Warner and Comcast, all of them want to fight to keep those subsidies in play. Yeah, well, the I mean, bottom line a, there is that they haven't figured out how yet to monetize it on the internet and make money by broadcasting their programming on the internet as an a la carte service. For, 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 for example, uh, for example I, I have HBO, right? So I have HBO Go, which allows me to have it on my mobile phone. Guess what? If I try to take my mobile phone and use HDMI out, it doesn't work. They block it. They don't want you, you to it. take your mobile phone to somebody else's house and watch HBO on their TV set using your paid subscription. Oh, they so, are you know, smart. What? 
That's they yeah, that smart. is smart. But where they're missing the boat. But chances is, are now they've got a device that you can log in with their their place too and do the same thing. You can yeah, share you can it with it, your family. You do, and yeah, you, I could do it with my PC. They would not know, right? I could do H, HDMI out. They would never. They would never know. But uh, my my point is, eventually these guys are going to go direct. They they have to. Correct. It makes more sense. They're going to do it. They'll make more money. It's the same they because they it t- costs so much money for this content to del- to make it. They can just maximize by going direct and they will go direct. Eventually they will go direct. And I think HBO is the biggest threat at the forefront of all this to the mall because they have the power to bring that forward and they fought this battle before back back in the day they fought with cable companies about being available a la carte. And won at one point, but I think the cable companies, through you know whatever uh, power they've had, probably through deregulation in the '90s, have bullied back. Where I think the tier systems now have prevailed, so you have to buy all these uh, tiers and gateways and stuff to even have access. Uh, and they were able to sort of put those uh, blocks back in place. But uh, you know, I think HBO has the power to do it. They have some of the best content. They they came out in the space really early with things like. You know, a Game of Thrones and things. You know, uh, with HBO Go pushing with a, uh, with uh, what's the what's the vampire show everybody loves? True Blood. You know, yeah. they were doing things like like previewing the next episode, really pushing people into their internet space and promoting Go really, really early on. And now they've kind of cooled to it. But I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of sharing going on with Go now that might actually be getting back into their bottom line. And maybe they're trying to figure out how they're going to push this space without hurting themselves and be able to actually take on the fight without, uh, without you know, falling before they get to the front, you know? I, I think, I, I don't know what the issue is like in America, but definitely in, in England, we have, I don't, I don't think we have the signal strength to uh, keep up with uh, family streaming content continuously. Because of course, if you if you uh, if you're streaming to your computer, you're watching like one thing at a time. But if you're watching TV, people just watch it all the time. It's just on in the background. If they're going to be streaming stuff, it's it's in, in at least in the in cities around where I am, there is there is nowhere near like the the, the strength. That is of the a very yeah. That I got one quick comment point. from one quick comment from uh, our outside live audience, Dan Nichols. I think the copyright issue comes into play when you start charging it for out, for charging for it outside the agreement with the original broadcaster. So, yeah, yeah that I, might I, be... Uh, I tried to articulate obvious. that, but I haven't slept for two days, so my points were a little bit... Out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Sarian, you are right on that, because realize that there are already a lot of legal battles on that, on who actually pays for the amount of bandwidth that is coming, that is being used for all these streaming services. Realize that you know Hulu, Netflix, yeah. uh, and all those are using close to eighty percent of network bandwidth at four to four to ten p.m. on most days in any given area. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's an, another issue. Is that, is that the uh, those uh, internet providers are seeing that all that these other companies are making their fortune on the backs of, of their uh, infrastructure, you know, and so they want a, a piece of this somehow too. Well, maybe they're going to be the new uh, utility company, you know, just like uh, it is telephone or electricity or anything like that. Well, to me, it should be just like a just like a highway or. Uh, interstate system, but that's a whole other topic. Well, yeah. But then you definitely. then you start running into government, and you don't really want to take internet to government. Mm, no. Well, it, it truly, you know, I missed the, the prediction show, but the one thing that uh, I did have a prediction, and and this has already happened with cell phones. I think it's going to happen with cable providers eventually. We're going to stop looking at the, the consumption of media. And the devices, the way we do right now, you know, it used to be if you had a cell phone, you were concerned how many cell minutes you got, how many talk time minutes do you get. Now cell providers are, we don't care, we'll give you unlimited minutes on your phone. You can talk as much as you want. But by the way, we're going to drag you over the coals for your data. And it's going to be the same thing with the cable companies. This is what's going to change. Mm -hmm. All of these people who have unlimited big fat pipes in their house, you might get a big fat pipe, but you're going to pay a big fat bill too. But that's, that's why I that's got. why Google, that's why Google Fiber is important, you know, to kind of keep that keep that in check going down, right? Oh, well, oh it's okay. not going to keep okay. it in check. It's going to make for bigger bills down the line. Oh, we can provide you the content now. You can consume it faster. We're going to make it easier for you to 
get a nice big fat. Yeah. Hey, but the, the other thing with Google, Google Fiber, the other thing with it, look back into uh, telecoms in the late '80s, early '90s. Okay, um, you had you had monopolies such as MCI and WorldCom that you know mm. controlled internet space, and they could set the prices how they want it. Competition is a free market's best friend, and as long as there's competition out there to keep it in check, you're going to see it stay as it is. But there's not competition when you have like all of these media companies completely consolidated into huge megacorps that control everything. But you know, you have a couple of do. players that control everything. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to get you're going to get a, I'm going to one last one last thing to say, and then we'll move on to the next topic. But uh, you know, you, you're going to get companies like Netflix producing their own content or YouTube producing their own content. So that eventually is going to force some other things to happen. But anyways, well, let's go back to Joseph. What do you think? Let's go to the next topic. I, I, you know what? There's no more topics to discuss. We've ran out of time. My gosh, this was such an important thought. We should have done this in the very beginning. This seems like everyone wanted to talk about this. Um, and out of all this stuff that's happened, we still got CES to talk about, but it's still going on. So hopefully by next week, we'll get the iron out to all the details from that little worm-looking thing. you got to be kidding me. Cell phones to the eight-core smartphone uh, processor. But I, I, uh, I heard they came out with a new Newton. The new Newton, yes, that's right. I did hear about that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, see, it's the reason I'm here. Come on. I know. I know. Ah! I know. That's all we can talk about. Is all the stuff that was in the news. There's only so much to talk about. We have like ten minutes left. Can we not just put a word in for the eight-core smartphone? Can I just say one thing? I think it's rubbish. Just because uh, from what I can see, my quad-core smartphones are actually no faster than uh, dual-core smartphones, or at least not sufficiently fast. They're not like twice as fast as everyone expects them to be. It's all about software mm -hmm. organization. Software? The, well, yeah. The, I don't care so much core, about power anymore. I think they all got a lot of power. I'm worried about battery life. It's just a game of yeah. it's, but, it's all about battery life if you're pushing the power numbers. envelope. Yeah. yeah. Razor but, yeah like, but my Guys, we, that, we got a new person who came into the room, Richard Cleveland. Uh, really cool guy. We 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 met him earlier, and he was just a fantastic uh, uh, mix and fit to the uh, tech and coffee community. We said, "Hey, why don't you come on, uh, Richard? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself?" Well, I spent uh, twenty plus years in broadcasting and the entertainment business. Uh, during that time, I got involved in computers as well. So, you know, it was kind of a hobby of mine. I built computers over the years. Actually, my first computer, believe it or not, was in a wooden box. You guys that are older than 40 will know what I'm talking about. You could order them out of the back of uh, Popular Science Magazine, if I remember right. So as things went on, I took some time off from the entertainment business, decided I was going to get away from it. I uh, went and got all my IT certs. Uh, I just recertified myself last year. And uh, then I decided I didn't want to do IT because it just bored the hell out of me. So I decided to go back into broadcasting on my own terms, and uh, that's how I formed Naked Ape Productions. Wow. Thank you very, very much, Richard. That was pretty awesome. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, see some more of your work, and we'll definitely appreciate uh, more of your input in our, our Tech & Coffee Newsweek. Um, Thanks for having me. I wish to uh, come on again whenever you want me to. Thank you. Now, before we go, we, we again, we still need to talk more about CS, but we'll have to do that for next time. We do need to give a shout-out to our, uh, our, our normal host, uh, Duke uh, Carrico. Apparently, he's got a little boo-boo in his mouth, so he can't talk too much. So, uh, And because he's got a boo-boo, he can't drink some of his most important um, life elixirs. So we're going to give this toast to you, my friend. Duke Carrico, get, Duke Carrico, get better soon, and uh, this beer is on me. Duke. Cheers, Duke. Take care, Duke. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sitting there drinking while I'm here with an empty bottle. Oh yes. <laughs> you just sat there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink everything. I'm gonna grow another beer. Yeah. Fuck. Good evening, sir. For Good more about I'm Tech News Week, please see us uh, at either Twitter using uh, at, at Tech and Coffee One, Facebook. Uh, or, or you can always see us on our ha uh, hashtag if you wanted to post. You can always see us on our our hangout. But uh, now we have our new Tech and Coffee communities. My name is Joe Yusuf. I'm the host of uh, this episode of Tech News Week. Thanks for watching.